This morning we'll be in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. I must admit this is one of my absolute favorite passages of Scripture. I think one of the clearest gospel declarations in all of God's word, uh, the Apostle Paul's um, reminding of Titus of the gospel in this section. And we've been continuing our study as we're coming close to the end of our study through our church's covenant. I'd like to read to you paragraph 7 of our church's covenant. It says this, We will work together for the continuance of a faithful gospel ministry in this church as we carry out its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry and its pastors, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel. Certainly we want to keep that in mind this morning as we read our text. And I'd like to read the text to you now, beginning in verse 3 of Titus chapter 3. Hear the word of the Lord. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. This is the word of God, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And no evil is done among us. The cry was muffled out by the chanting and the screams of the arena crowd. The wrath of the people and of the governor fell with special force upon Sanctus, a deacon from Vienne, and upon Blandina, a slave girl, weak in body, but invincible in spirit. They were tortured until their continuance in life seemed miraculous. Finally, Sanctus was roasted alive in an iron chair in the arena and Blandina was thrown before a wild boar and gored to death. Thus did two faithful martyrs pass from this mortal life to the immortal. Joined to their savior, faithful to the end in their gospel proclamation, their cry was the same as those born of the spirit, I am a Christian. That excerpt from Eusebius's church history mid to late second century martyrdom, as there were many during that period. We'll have two questions this morning out of form for Baptists. Number one, how can a Christian boldly live and proclaim the gospel? And two, how does the Christian live a gospel-changed life? How do you respond that way? What creates within a person the ability under immense torture and persecution to declare the truth? To stand upon the gospel truth and say, I am a Christian and even die. And what is the fruit that flows from such a life? How do we live before God in boldness in this fallen world? Our context of Titus is important. 
In chapter 1, the Apostle Paul reminds Titus that his reason for being an apostle, he tells Titus two things, the sake of the faith of God's elect, chapter 1, verse 1, and there, that is the elect's knowledge of the truth. Essentially, the gospel and doctrine. Paul instructs Titus to appoint elders in every town. And that's in chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. And then Paul admonishes Titus to teach sound doctrine. And there's this reoccurring theme of the importance of teaching what is right. And there's another thing that Paul stresses throughout this short letter and that is of good works. Paul tells Titus to remember the Christians to be submissive, obedient, and ready for every good work in chapter 3, verse 1. And that's the context that we come to in verse 3. Who we were. Verse 3 says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. It was interesting to read these words, and, and you know, it's important that we understand what they mean. And I was a little, you know, there'll be times you read, and, and there's not too much removal from our usage today, but want to give you a brief description of what these words in Greek mean. To be foolish is ignoring what is right, purposely seeking that which is wrong. That's why we call our children foolish, because they purposely do that which is wrong. Disobedient, unwilling to believe, disobedient to the gospel. Deceived, seduced by sin, led astray enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, absolute subjugation to sinful desires, no freedom, malice and envy, endeavoring to do evil to others, hateful and hating one another, active ill will in words and deeds towards others. Every description that Paul gives here is of intentional wrong. Not by accident, not by mistake. It's a pursuit of wickedness, a pursuit of evil. And Paul says, we ourselves were once. He uses the past tense when admonishing Titus. This is who we were. It's important, Christians, that we remember. We remember what it is God has saved us from, the pit that we have been dug from. Paul's drawing out in verses 1 and 2 that continual, we used to fight against, uh, we used to speak evil, uh, we were. These, again, past tense usages and yet still a necessary element when we come to gospel truth. We were not born in righteousness. We were not born in the kingdom of God. We were brought in by Christ. We see a glimpse, though, of that old man, don't we, from day to day. If we lie to our boss, co-workers if we lie to our children or our spouse when we slander when we gossip when we curse when we mock when we entertain wicked thoughts when we covet when we hate one another we feel that old man who never seems to be too far off the importance of the gospel truth is magnified when we remember what it is that Christ has saved us from. And there's an urgency in the gospel. 
Again, as I said earlier, this is one of the most clear gospel presentations in all of the scriptures. And certainly Titus would know the gospel. He's pastoring a church. But Paul reminds him, towards the end of his letter, he reminds him. And I think it's important that the urgency of the gospel, the importance of the gospel in the life of the Christian is never gone. You never outgrow it. You will never outread it. You will never outlearn it. Is the foundation upon which the fact that we stand in Christ's righteousness. If you'd turn with me really quick to Luke chapter 16, as we consider the urgency of the gospel. In Luke chapter 16, we'll begin reading in verse 19. And Jesus has been giving up to this point a series of, of parables and teachings. And we come to verse 19 in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And beginning in verse 19, we read this. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember, you in your lifetime received the good things, and Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house for I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. There is urgency. Who is urgent in this passage? The rich man. The rich man is earnest, urgent. Send, send Lazarus to my family. Warn them not to come to this place. When we consider the urgency of the gospel, I think it is paramount that we remember the truths of Scripture, the reality that we die. We are dying. We will die. That can be lost on us when we're young. We certainly get to be middle-aged and <laughs> realize it's going quickly. And I'm sure as I progress in age, we'll feel much quicker. But the point is that there is an urgency associated with the gospel proclamation. Not lackadaisical, not secondary, primary. My dad used to tell me, Jesus' last commands should be our first priority. And in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. It's important when we come to the question of the gospel and the role that it is plays in our life, both in our conversion and what we declare 
that there is certainly urgency associated with the gospel. And you might think, listen, I want my unsaved family to come to Christ. I want them to believe. I want my neighbor to come to Christ. But I'm scared. I'm nervous. I, I, I think I have the courage and then I go to share the gospel with them and, and I just can't and I talk about the weather. I want to consider three elements and this is no, by no means exhaustive, but for my own life personally, three things that I have encountered that have hindered my faithfulness to proclaim the gospel. One is boldness. The ability to get out of my comfort zone to engage somebody and not wait for them to bring up spiritual things, but to actively go and proclaim. In Ephesians 6, again, we don't have our notes, so I would encourage you, some of these things I'm going to throw out at you, if you are taking notes, write these passages down. And this is one I would write down, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, and it says this, the Apostle Paul, and also pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. That encourages me. If the great apostle needed the church to pray for him to be bold, so do we. So do I. The other is fear of man. I may overcome my boldness and get the courage up and then encounter somebody who's seven foot three or is very intelligent and eloquent and able to argue. And that fear of man springs up in me and I close my mouth and I shudder away and I don't declare the truth of the gospel. And in Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Fear of man should not hinder us from the urgency of the gospel. And I have been ashamed. I am ashamed to admit to you I have been ashamed of the gospel. And in Luke 9.26, our Lord says, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And these three things, certainly your mind maybe has already gone there, but one example that comes to mind is Stephen. If you turn to Acts chapter 7 really quick. Of course, in Acts chapter 7, we have the testimony of Stephen. Beginning in verse 54 of chapter 7 of Acts, we read this. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he, falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
don't know if there's a more powerful testimony in scripture. Certainly, Stephen was bold. He was not exhibiting fear of man, and he was certainly not ashamed of the gospel. And he was killed, martyred for his faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, we read this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. I think that's what Stephen had on his mind. It certainly wasn't the temporal. It certainly wasn't now. He was a faithful servant of Christ. And he was bold. He was bold in his gospel proclamation. That's why they stoned him. We can be tempted to come to a passage like this and, and forget I certainly can get caught up in a woe is me attitude. Remember what we said at the beginning. Paul says, you were, not now, you were. So we come to verse 4, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It is the goodness and the kindness of God that he saves us. Paul uses the language not of works, and he uses this throughout his letters it's clear in Paul's theology that works play not no role, but certainly the role that works play in the life of the Christian are post-salvation. They're not before. And this is a good reminder for all of us because we have a tendency to fall back into that old place, that old way of thinking, well, if I just show up and set up chairs, if I just go feed the hungry if I just no when we are talking about salvation it is in and only through the blood of Jesus Christ amen and the scriptures speak to this in Isaiah 64 6 what are our righteousness what is it filthy rags all of our righteousness is filthy rags in Jeremiah 17 9 the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. In Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in trespasses and sins. In Romans 3.10 and 11, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. This is an essential element when we come to the gospel both in our proclamation and in our remembering, to drive us back to the cross. Paul is then going to come along, and, and more, I just want to say really quick, more than normal, a normal exposition, I would take much more time. But i got to be honest with you. You can read much of the scripture, and in particularly, especially this passage, I don't need to say anything. We could read this passage this morning and we know what we were. And we know what we're supposed to do. God's word doesn't need me to draw anything else out. of it. But I say that just that we're dealing with a lot of verses, but I'm going to hit on a couple of particular things. The next one is heirs of eternal life. We were unsaved, 
we have been brought by Christ into the kingdom of God. Paul ends verse 6 by saying, or excuse me, verse 7, that by saying uh, justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And the result, the result of our being born again, the result of the work of Christ's work for us and on our behalf is that we have been made heirs. That is, we will have an inheritance, something that we are waiting for. In John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In 1 John 5, verse 11, it says, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Why is this important? I think, honestly, the end of verse 7 is the key to the boldness we were talking about, the faithfulness in the gospel. It can't be understated the significance that this represents for us. And I think even sometimes I don't realize how much fear of death, fear of dying, infiltrates my life and my thinking and instructs my decisions, my lack of boldness, my fear of man, or even being ashamed. Fear of losing a job. If I don't have a job, I don't make money. If I don't make money, I can't pay rent. I can't buy food. If I can't have food, oh, let's not even talk about that. Fear of poor health. If I have poor health, I'll get sicker. If I get more sick, I'm going to die. Yep. We don't realize how much the fear of dying infiltrates our life. Maybe you do. I do not. It seems to stare at me from every angle, from every choice, from every decision. And yet we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 54, the Apostle Paul says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's the gospel. That is the good news. Death is swallowed up in the victory of Christ. How can Stephen embrace martyrdom? How do the apostles endure alienation from their nation, from their family, from their friends, be tortured, lose everything here, and proclaim Christ in boldness? Because their life isn't here. Their eyes are fixed on the inheritance eternal life. This plays a role in how we live. It's important that we consider too briefly the things that flow out of gospel conversion. We've been born again. As we saw, we were once those things. We are now in Christ. And I don't think by chance our church covenant has the language of worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine. When we consider worship in the life of the Christian, think about this passage, John chapter 4, 
verses 23 through 24, Jesus says, the hour is coming and now is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Who worships God rightly? Only those people who've been born again. The ordinances. Pastor David shared wonderfully from Romans 6, our last Lord's Day gathering. And in Romans 6, verses 4 and 5, it says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in a death like his, and we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, we read, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the blood that we break, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? The ordinances of baptism and the Lord's table flow out of gospel transformation. Discipline. In 1 Corinthians 5, 11 and 12, we read, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside the church. Purge the evil from among you. The role of discipline in the church only exists in the church. And doctrine in John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness of me. Worship, the ordinance says, discipline, doctrine. These things exist only in the sphere of the people of God. They have no place outside they're only right through the gospel. And so as we've considered our first point, boldness, how do, we, how do we live boldly? If I could leave you with one thing, it's the end of verse seven. Keep your eyes fixed as an heir of eternal life. You will not be here for very long. It seems like only a few weeks ago we were first coming into this space when my family came, and that was in August of 2019. Time goes by very quickly. And as we've considered, the urgency of the gospel is essential. Keep your eyes fixed on eternal life, life with Christ. And the second thing I wanted to consider this morning, and we may hit that three hours, How do we live? How does that work itself out in the light of the gospel? What do we do? It's interesting that if you read through Titus, and I encourage you to, to, if time allows us Lord's Day, just sit down and read through these three short chapters of Titus. And one thing that's going to pop up over and over again is the language of good works. In chapter 1, we're there, we're in Titus 3. Turn one page, you'll be right there. In chapter 1, verse 16, we read, They profess to know God. He's speaking of false teachers. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for every good work. So that's the false teachers, the false proclaimers. 
But Paul is going to go on at least five more times to reference good works. In chapter 2, verse 7, he says, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity. That's his admonition to Titus. Be a model of good works. In verse 14, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. In 3.1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. And down in verse 8 of our text this morning, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And lastly, in verse 14, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. Do you see this theme playing itself out? Gospel good works works that are done by the Christian are not an addendum. We talked about that already. They're not a means by which we are brought into the kingdom. They're an outflowing of change. A person who's been born again by God is completely changed. Completely. And one of the ways that we can talk about good works is giving and it looks different it's not all the same giving in of time we saw people this weekend and, and leading up for really months now giving of time and resources and care and of themselves in the process of moving from where we gather I've been on the receiving end of giving, giving of time, giving of resources, even just people giving of themselves to pray for me, to care for me. In Acts chapter 2, verse 45, it says, And they were, that is the church, selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And there was joy and intentionality in their giving. In Hebrews 10, verse 34, it says, For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession, an abiding one. That eternal life thing, that heirs of eternal life thing comes into play. There are three things I really quickly wanted to consider about giving. It's intentional. The model we see in Scripture in Acts and in other places is that giving is intended upon by the giver. It's voluntary. There's no one but God who can tell you what to give, when to give, and is to be joyful. I think we can see all three of these things present in Paul's admonition in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 5, it says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift and not as an exaction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. When we come to the topic of giving, I don't know if there's another passage that is more clear than that one. My dad used to tell me, when I was young, we were pretty poor. And if I had worked or done something to earn money, you know, my parents wanted to model giving of what we have. 
to God. And man, I would cling to those dollar bills. But my parents never forced me. And I remember as I got older, I said, you know, you never made me. You always reminded me. Give to the Lord first of what he's given you. But you never made me do it. My dad just kind of sat there for a minute and he thought it over and he said, the scriptures admonish, admonish us to give to God joyfully. He said, God doesn't need your money. And if you aren't going to give it joyfully, he certainly doesn't want it. And that, I have remembered that. And that has stuck with me. Sometimes money is the easiest thing to give. And yet, that is not the only way that the church is to live. We're to give of ourselves. Giving of resources for the work of ministry and the support of pastors and the care of the poor is a tremendous blessing. If we cannot view that, see that as the blessing that it is, then we really have to check our hearts. I have to check my heart. The support of the ministry is admonished in scripture. In Philippians 4, 15 and 17, Paul says, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. And in support of pastors, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living from the gospel and the relief of the poor religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James 127. It's important that we remember these things flow out of the gospel. They flow out of what we have prioritized. I have too many notes this morning. When we talk about good works and what flows out, I'm not gonna give you an encyclopedic list so that we can go through and check them off. But I would like to encourage you that even as I was reading through, back through our church covenant, if you read the covenant statements for our church, one, we will work and pray for the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And two, who will walk in love, care, and watchfulness, admonishing as needs be. In three, not forsaking the gathering of God's people. And four, discipleship, modeling gospel faithfulness. Five, rejoicing and grieving. And six, guarding our witness and living in holiness before God. Seven, gospel proclamation and faithful care for the church. And eight, continuing in the Christian life, where, wherever we are, in faithful obedience to God. These were my quick little ways of sh shortening so that I could remember them better. But the more I read through, the more I realized these things are only present when the gospel has changed us. These things are only real and true when we remember the gospel when we've been changed by the gospel. Two things, and we'll close up. Do we exercise urgency in the gospel? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I would encourage you to write this one down, highlight it, memorize it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ. 
be reconciled to God. I have so many family who have died in sin. Friends, co-workers. Some I had opportunities to share the gospel with and in disobedience did not. But I want to continue the rest of my time in this life in boldness, unashamed, with my eyes fixed on eternal life. So let me encourage you from, my, from a place of failure to be bold and remember the urgency of the gospel. And the second thing I'd like to leave you with this morning is are we living as heirs of eternal life? In John chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Good works in the Christian life cost us something. They cost us time, sometimes patience, sometimes money. But good works, as the scriptures admonish us to do, are easy when we remember we already have the greatest inheritance. You do now. You have the greatest inheritance now. Eternal life. You can't buy it. You can't trade for it. You won't find it on eBay. If we can remember the urgency of the gospel, if we can remember our citizenship, the inheritance awaiting us, in truth, it manifests in real ways that in torture, you endure. That in want, you rejoice. And as we see one another in need, it is followed with good works. Let's pray. Lord God, we confess to you that we are not sufficient for these things, that, Lord, we are prone to forget. I am prone to forget. Lord, your word is faithful and true, and it doesn't change. Lord, even as I've been reminded in this study of the urgency of the gospel, Lord, as if you've reminded me of the inheritance, of much more value than anything I could ever attain on my own. Lord, as we're reminded of these things, we ask that you would, would grant us by your spirit to walk in your spirit and do these things. Lord, embolden us, remind us, remind us of your goodness. God, we thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen.